Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about managing your land for game birds. My name is Amy Spaulding and I am a forester for the National Wild Turkey Federation. Um, I'm guessing probably several of you may have heard of this organization before. You may be a member, um, but in case you haven't, we're a nonprofit, non-governmental conservation group that's focused on the conservation of the wild turkey and the preservation of our hunting heritage. Um, and in my work, I work in a partnership with a, a part of the federal government known as the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So they're within the USDA and they really are responsible for providing technical and financial assistance through Farm Bill programs mm -hmm. to private landowners and forest landowners, ranchers all across the US. So in my work in the partnership, I really kind of concentrate and I work directly with forest landowners. Um, I'm the only one here in Indiana with this position, but I have several coworkers scattered across the country that also work in their states to help just um, increase um, landowner engagement on forest lands and kind of break down some of those barriers for conservation. Um, and hi, everybody. So I'm Sam Dame. Um, I currently work for NRCS. Um, I'm a natural resources specialist, um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, Farm Bill Biologists. So um, prior to this position with NRCS, I was the Southwest uh, Indiana Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever Farm Bill Biologist. And um, similar to Amy, um, the Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever Biologists work in a partnership with NRCS. Um, and they can help provide uh, technical assistance if you're interested in just technical assistance. Uh, they can also help with programmatic assistance if you're interested in some farm bill programs. Um, there's several of them throughout the state. Um, the southwest area right now is Olivia Fry. Then we have Savannah in the south, uh, southeast, uh, Michael Smith in central Indiana, and then up northern Indiana, Jacob Frame, and then northeast is Ryan. There is also a Northwest position. Um, I believe they are currently filling that position right now, um, but you can definitely reach out to any of your Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever farm bill biologists also. They can provide you with really great assistance. Um, they're just one of multiple people that we will talk about um, also again at the end that can help you um, just provide assistance for habitat work. And so here's just a little overview we kind of wanted to provide um, at the beginning uh, a little agenda of what we're going to talk about today. So first thing, we're kind of just going to talk about Habitat 101, what it is, um, then we'll talk about uh, bobwhite quail and wild turkey life cycles, so you know, two really popular um, game bird species. Then I'll talk a little bit about managing grasslands, uh, and Amy's going to talk about managing the forest land. And then we're going to wrap it up, um, talk about some resources where you can find additional help or additional information. So first off, um, Habitat uh, 101, what is Habitat? Um, what do you think of when you think of Habitat? So Habitat is really composed of kind of these four main things. We have food, cover, water, and space. And when one of those things is missing, wildlife have to travel or move around to try to find it. Um, and on the right here, we kind of have a little habitat chart. On the bottom, you'll kind of see um, what we call like a successional stage progression. So towards the left, you have younger, earlier successional stages, your, your bare field, your grassland. And as you move towards the right, you'll get later successional or older habitat areas. And then above that, you can kind of see where different wildlife, the lines represent their use of these different successional stages. So we have some wildlife that's kind of more uh, generalist, I would say, like your white-tailed deer and your turkey, and their line covers a, a good range of those um, different successional stages. And um, then you have some wildlife that's a bit more specific, kind of your bob whites that stick to that earlier time frame in succession. Um, but this kind of just uh, gives you a little visual and a representation that some species habitats component components can look very different from each other and species use habitat with different structures and different compositions during different times of their lives uh, which we're going to chat a bit more about here in just a second <laughs> yeah so when thinking about habitat uh, that is a great thing to think about when you're looking at your property 
So a lot of times when Sam or I, we meet with a landowner prior to going to meet with them, we may pull out an aerial photograph and take a look at what type of habitat compositions they have on their property. And while that can give you a lot of clues, if you want to look at what kind of resources are out there for different wildlife, you have to look a little bit beyond those property boundaries too. So zoom out a little bit. I mean, maybe they are in an area where it is closed canopy forest and that's what they have on their property. And that's what's present in all of the surrounding lo locations, kind of like property A. Or maybe they're in an area where there's a diversity of different open and forest habitat across the landscape. Or maybe you're like property C. Maybe you've got a good diversity of open land and forest land and water, but surrounding you, you might be being encroached on by not so suitable habitat. So thinking about what's on your property and also around in the landscape is really important. And that's really important because those are all different components of what these species are gonna need throughout their life cycle. So what types of food are, sources are available? Um, and then also realizing that even if some species can utilize a variety of habitat, there might be certain times in their life cycle when one type is really important. So is there adequate nesting cover? Is there places for them to do brood rearing? Um, what is the, how far away is the closest water resource? So thinking about all of these components and then kind of thinking about how they are interspersed together, how they're laid out. How far does something have to travel to get what it needs? Um, oftentimes in our landscapes, we might find that there's a variety of this stuff, but one of them that is very critical might be very limited. So maybe looking at these and evaluating them and seeing where we can best put our time and our attention and efforts to. Yeah, and to kind of highlight that, we wanted to get a little bit into um, quail and turkey life cycles, kind of a year in the life of, of what they're doing and some, some different needs that they have. So for quail, the nesting um, period typically begins in May. Um, once the nest is complete, the females will begin laying their eggs, usually one per day, and you'll get 12 to 15 total. And then 23 days later, those eggs will all hatch within minutes of each other. Um, and only about 25% of nest attempts are successful by quail. And the chicks are precocial, which means they are up and moving, ready to go right after they're hatched. Um, so they're able to feed themselves almost immediately and they're taken away from the nest to begin feeding in these brood rearing areas. Um, and then as the fall approaches, we go through summer, um, the quail will seek out areas of heavy cover with higher seed production. Um, and the downtime for these quail is kind of spent dusting and preening and resting in areas with overhead cover. Um, the fall shuffle will happen. So up until this point, a lot of quail are with their kind of family units. Um, so the fall shuffle is really important so they can uh, interact and switch up with the quail that are not related to them. Um, and then these coveys will then seek out shrubs and brambles and thick woody cover in winter, um, what we call covey headquarters to really protect themselves from snow and get um, some thermal cover. And then by spring, uh, the population is at its lowest level, and then the birds will begin to pair off again for nesting. Um, and uh, wild quail actually rarely live more than 14 months. So a year in the life of a quail is, is about the quail's whole life a lot of the time. <laughs> and so now we're gonna talk about a little, little more in depth about each of these habitat um, components. And I want to do a quick overview of these different habitat components that quail use um, and hope you guys can keep these in mind uh, as we talk later about various management options um, to help create or maintain these different components that quail will use through their life. So nesting areas, um, an ideal ratio uh, would be about 30% of the area would be in this nesting area, nesting cover. Um, good nesting habitat for quail is last year's old growth, so they'll get, build their nests out of that old um, grass residue. Uh, quail will prefer to nest in habitat that's 8 to 12 inches high, and studies have shown that a lot of quail prefer to nest within 75 feet of an edge, and an edge is just a transition area between kind of one uh, habitat structure and another, so a field edge with a fence row. Um, quail are also very small, so um, an edge to them may be 
a few shrubs clumped together. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, a big field edge like we may traditionally think about. Um, edge can be a lot of things for quail. Mm -hmm. And so next we have um, quail brood rearing habitat, um, what we call kind of an early successional area, uh, about 40% um, of the area in, in early successional brood rearing habitat is kind of the ideal ratio. Um, and these uh, early successional areas have bare ground, they have bugs, they have some overhead cover. The open ground underneath the canopy of forbs and grasses is really important for brood rearing. Um, so you can kind of see in this picture here, that's a little quail chick. Um, they are about the size of a bumblebee when they're born. So when they're led away from their nests to begin feeding, uh, they really need to be able to move through that undergrowth. And if you have a lot of thick thatch on the bottom, they won't be able to move through that particularly easy. Um, and they need an area with forbs and flowers. These forbs and flowers are what bring in the bugs. And uh, quail chicks are dependent on them for the first several weeks of their lives, just a, a diet of insects. Um, the bare ground also provides dusting areas and it makes it easier for the adult birds to feed. Uh, quail are not very strong scratchers. Um, they're kind of sight feeders, so if they can't see the seeds, if they can't really see the food, if it's underneath a layer of thatch, they can't really get to it. And kind of the last main ha uh, quail habitat component is quail winter habitat. This shrubby cover ideally would be about 10 to 25 percent of their area. The ideal patch size is about 1,500 square feet, which is about three school buses kind of lined up next to each other. We all like to be within about 75 feet of that shrubby cover edge um, to provide escape cover for thermal cover in the winter. Winter is really a critical time for quail. Like I said, uh, coming out of that winter, their habitat or their habitat, their uh, populations are at the lowest levels. Um, and it's really vital for them to be able to have that thermal cover component in the winter. And with quail, the amount of habitat is not quite as important as the distribution. Um, so the softball test is a good way to think about habitat distribution for quail. If you can't throw a softball and hit shrubby cover from where you're standing, then you might not have enough. Um, this 1,500 square feet, the ideal size of a uh, cubby headquarters, um, it, it's kind of a large patch of shrubs. Um, but if you think about it in a distribution standpoint, um, it's a little bit easier so say, you know, we talked about evaluating what's on your property and what's around your property a little bit ago. So if you have a neighbor that has a really nice fence row, um, maybe you don't need to worry as much about shrubby cover. Or if they have a really nice pollinator planting, maybe you could add some shrubs kind of along the edge of your property next to it. Um, so really the distribution is, is more, almost more important than the actual amount itself. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, wild turkey. Here in Indiana, um, we have the eastern wild turkey. It's one of five subspecies. So in other parts of the U.S., you might have the Osceola, the Rio Grande, the Miriams, or the Gold Turkey. Um, this general turkey life cycle, a young tur baby turkey is generally referred to as a colt. And an adult male is a gobbler or a tom, and an adult female is a hen. And you can often can differentiate these two as well as um, adolescent males or jakes just by their feather, feather coloration and different aspects on their body. So let's just go through a little bit of a year in the life of a wild turkey. So um, this is kind of a season or the winter season is kind of one that we're just transitioning out of right now. This is a time when wild turkeys are gonna be probably using a lot of forest areas and um, open crop areas, and then they're kind of transitioning to their spring areas. So this is a time when it's really exciting to see turkeys because you're probably gonna see them outside um, strutting and doing displays for hens, or you may even be able to catch some males fighting in an area to try to kind of figure out their pecking order. This is also a time when um, a lot of breeding starts to occur and females or hens start to begin mm -hmm. seeking out what kind of favorable habitat they're gonna need for nesting. So this is really as a combination of both forest and open areas. And the turkeys are really gonna be using, um, you know, probably whatever is left over in terms of hard mass, like acorns and hickory nuts or other waste grains. And then as the weather warms up, probably a lot of insects that they can 
forage easily in those um, open field areas as well too. Mm -hmm. um, so then as um, winter transitions mm -hmm. into spring and most of the breeding has occurred, um, that's the time when a hen is gonna start looking out for good areas for nesting. They're ground nesters and they make kind of a simple nest on the ground, just a shallow depression. Um, a hen is not going to lay all of her eggs at once. It takes place over um, several days, probably about one egg a day. They're gonna typically lay about 10 to 12 eggs. And after their eggs are all laid, they're gonna go through the incubation period where they're gonna be sitting on that nest almost, um, almost all day. They're only gonna be leaving for brief times when they're gonna be going out to look for some food and some water. So that's kind of a very vulnerable time for a hen because normally at nighttime, they are gonna be roosting in the trees. So when they're on the ground, they're a lot more vulnerable to predators. So as you can imagine, they're looking for areas that are gonna have good cover and have them be camouflaged. Um, Cause a lot of those nests may be lost from predators, but thankfully about half of adult hens will attempt to re-nest if their first one wasn't successful. So the right type of habitat is well-developed forest understories or areas with vegetation, with overhead cover. And a lot of times these nesting sites are really near forest or field edges as well too. Um, the spring transitions into summer. Um, we got a lot of other different activity because hopefully those successful nests are starting to hatch. We're um, having a flush of holes. So with it, after about two days of hatching, the poults are ready to start following mom around and they're looking for food. Um, they need to go out and find places that they can get to easily for frequent feeding. And for their first two weeks of life, they cannot fly, they're on the ground. So they're spending nights on the ground, all their time on the ground, and they are very vulnerable as well too. A lot of mortality is high during this time period. So they're looking for areas that they can go out to feed in and then where there's gonna be adequate amounts of escape cover or just general good cover and also where mom can look around and she can be able to anticipate any threats and give the signal to her poults that it's time to hightail it out of here and get to a place that we can hide. And during that time they really are just focused on high protein insect diets because they're doing um, a lot of growth and they're trying to fuel the development of those feathers that are going to be important for flight later. Um, as summer transitions into fall, we see uh, another change. A lot of the flocks start to kind of break apart. You might have older males being in separate flocks where hens and their young are going to remain together through much of the fall and the winter. And they're going to be utilizing forest areas a lot more. Um, they're going to be depending on um, hard mass like acorns. And so the area that they're using for their range during this time period might really depend on the availability or maybe the scarcity of, of those acorns. There's not a lot of stuff. They might have to travel further. If they have a good mass year and there's good resources, they might be able to utilize a smaller area. They also are going to use um, agricultural fields. So you might see them out there um, utilizing waste grains or maybe even just going out in the in the fall to those open fields and looking for insects, especially after a uh, spring rain. I'm sorry, a fall rain. I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Yeah, so uh, if you're interested in habitat, um, there's definitely a few questions that we recommend you ask yourself um, before you get started. Um, some things to think about. Uh, are you interested in cost share programs? What species in particular are you interested in promoting? Um, some, some habitat can support a wide, a lot of habitat can support a wide variety of species, but if there's something, a species in particular that has a particular habitat need, maybe you're more interested in working towards that. Um, what are the potential challenges you see to uh, establishing or maintaining habitat areas? Um, I really want everyone to keep this one in mind. Um, so hopefully we can address these, hopefully we address these for you uh, later on in the presentation, but if we don't, we'd love to talk about it with you at the end. Um, and then, of course, what equipment do you have? If you don't have it, can you borrow it? Uh, how much time can you dedicate? And then what's your budget for these projects? Uh, and then the biggest thing before you get started is definitely having a long-term plan. Uh, you don't want to start a project and not necessarily know where it's going. So it's good to have that planned out ahead of time. Yeah, plans are extremely important. Um, especially forest management plans, because they're going to go over what you want to do in the woods, 
um, what kind of things are out there right now, what types of trees, their distribution. They're going to talk about maybe some issues that you might have on your property and you know where you really want your property to be. And they're going to consider those factors and they're going to make recommendations that are going to lay out actions and they're going to uh, lay out a schedule of activities. And they also include two maps that show you what to do where. So they let you know what to do, where to do it, and when to do it. And a lot of the cost share programs that we work with require a, a, a management plan. So with forestry related stuff, you need to have a current plan less than a year old or something that's been updated recently in order to um, apply for some of these programs. So you may wonder, how do I get one? And if you own land and it's enrolled in the Classified Forest and Wildlands Program, you likely already have a forest management plan. So reach out to your district forester if you are unable to locate a copy, or maybe they can help you with updating a plan. If you would like a more detailed plan, or maybe you're just not in that program, you also can reach out to the Natural Resource Conservation Service because there is funding to hire a technical service provider to help prepare a plan for you. And a technical service provider is usually a forester for hire that receives special training on a lot of our NRCS programs. So the process to do that is, a, is pretty easy. It's a lot simpler than applying for some of the other programs, but there, there is that option out there to help you get that plan. So now we're going to kind of talk about some of the different management options that are out there um, for you on your property. Um, so some of those options include invasive species control. Uh, if you don't have an open grassland area, you can create a warm season grass and forb habitat. If you maybe already have an open space or an idle area, you can uh, renovate it. Or if it's kind of an older CRP planting, um, ways to maintain and manage that in the future. Um, then Amy's going to go over some you know, more of those woodland management practices, your edge feathering, uh, tree and shrub planting, forest stand improvement, and timber harvest. Um, but again, however you want to improve your habitat, definitely number one is have a plan. And then make sure you've gathered all your tools and resources together beforehand. Um, you know, that, that's definitely an important step also. If you are thinking you want to plant something with a no-till drill, then having that contact or knowing where you're going to get that before you're ready to plant is definitely important. So first off, um, kind of talking about invasive species, um, this can be a great option uh, for habitat improvement. Sometimes the bones of what you've got for habitat is there and it's good. And the only issue really is that it's just being smothered out by invasive species. Um, so removing invasive species from an area can be a great way to uh, kind of immediately improve habitat for wildlife. Um, so these invasive species, uh, of non-native plants um, and some uh, invasive uh, animal species, they can affect wildlife through both a trophic, which is kind of a food, and a non-trophic or habitat uh, pathways, both directly and indirectly. And these non-native plants, they can present similar structural cues, but provide different levels of resources than native plants do. And that can trigger habitat selection by animals, which is not coupled up with the resources that they've grown used to evolutionarily to show them that they have good habitat. So basically, the invasive species may make a habitat that looks and feels like it's supposed to for wildlife, what they're evolutionally um, normally would choose, but the resources that those habit that, that new habitat with the invasive species is providing doesn't provide those that wildlife with their full suite of needs or nutrition or shelter, um, one of those, one or all of those habitat components. And so some of the kind of the four main ways that uh, invasive species affect wildlife habitat is they can um, create a different structure. So non-native cool season grasses um, in an area, they don't provide that same open bare ground uh, structure underneath the canopy that our native warm season grasses do as they grow in a clump form. And these, a lot of these non-native cool season grasses grow in a, a mat or from a rhizome. Um, uh, non-native species can really reduce the diversity of the area. I'm sure you could potentially picture in your mind um, an area that looks like a monoculture completely taken over by maybe something like Canada thistle or uh, Johnson grass. 
Um, so reduced diversity is, is never a good thing. Um, altered disturbance regimes. So in areas out west, they have an invasive grass called cheat grass, and that has actually changed the, um, the fire regime out there. Um, and it's altered it from its historical, historical return interval. And then these invasive species can also change just generally how uh, resources are cycling in a habitat. And some of grasslands most wanted invasive species are uh, Cerisia lespedeza, tall fescue, um, Johnson grass, autumn olive, Greek canary grass, multiflora rose, uh, common teasel, Canada thistle, poison hemlock, and calorie pear. And uh, Cerisia lespedeza and autumn olive were both initially planted um, because uh, we thought that they would be good for wildlife nutritionally and, you know, come to find out later that Cerisia lespedeza quail eat it, but nutritionally it's too dense and hard of a seed for them to really digest. And then things like autumn olive, you'll see birds do love it. Birds like to eat autumn olive, um, but it's like eating a candy bar versus some of their native foods, which provide more protein and more of those essential nutrients that they really need. Grasslands aren't the only place where we've got issues with invasives. Um, they are definitely a big issue inside of forest areas, especially if that forest area uh, has a history of maybe being used for agricultural uses in the past and then has returned to forests. And there are a whole suite of different species, many similar to grassland that affect this. But the good news is that there, there is hope. I mean, you can get in there and you can treat these invasives like for instance, the picture with the invasive brush like multiflora rose and Asian bush honeysuckle, with just a few really targeted treatments, you can really be successful and you can help to reclaim and restore that habitat. This is a great resource that I think both Sam and I use with, with landowners. Um, this is the invasive species calendar of control, but it really highlights um, many of our different common invasive species and gives great advice on when to treat them, how to treat them. Um, a lot of this stuff isn't stuff that you can go in and just do one year of treatment and kind of be done. You might be going in for consecutive years to really get um, good control on it as well too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a great resource for sure. <laughs> All right. So if you are interested in creating a new grassland area on your property, um, definitely choosing the right location is going to be really important. Um, making sure you have good site prep is key. That's probably the biggest thing I hope people take away um, from this talk if you're interested in creating grasslands is that to really put a lot of energy and commitment into your site preparation. Um, and then choosing native seed is going to be important, like we just talked about. You know, invasives, uh, you know, they different types of invasive species have been pushed for wildlife in the past, but they may not have all the nutrients and they're not evolutionarily adapted to these wildlife species. So definitely choosing native seed, getting the right mix, the right, the right um, combination of seeds in that mix, uh, having the right planting time and planting method, and being ready for first year maintenance, and then definitely to continue monitoring your planting. Uh, you can't really plant these and walk away. You definitely need to pay attention to what's out there. And for our grasslands in particular, um, regular rotational disturbance management is really going to be needed. You know, not every year, every three to four years, you'll probably be out there doing some sort of disturbance management on at least part of it. So thinking about that, that commitment when you're thinking about creating a grassland area. So your, your sunny spots that aren't frequently flooded are going to establish the quickest, quickest and the easiest for um, looking for a new place to create grassland habitat. Um, site preparation can take a full year. So being prepared when you're thinking about your timeline and the time that you can commit to some of these projects, um, site prep is, is something that is going to take a little while. It's going to take some time, and it's definitely worth it. Uh, a general formula that we kind of use for site prep um, if an area is in a different kind of cover, would be to mow the area low, mid to late summer, maybe sometime in August, allow six to eight inches of regrowth, and then spray the area with a broad spectrum herbicide, sometimes September, October, and then allow another six inches of regrowth and spray again. And the following spring, as things start to green up and come back up, spray it one more time before you plant. Um, 
The site preparation also will depend on the planting method you want to use and what kind of cover is there. So there's a lot of variables, but that's kind of just a, a generic site prep formula. Um, but planting into a uh, vegetation-free firm seed bed is going to be very important. And if you're looking at an area and you see greenery, um, you feel like the vegetation and weed pressure is high, just stop. It's best to wait and plant it when the site prep is right and trying to fix it later. Once your seed is in the ground, you have much more limited options on what you can do to kind of correct, correct an issue. Uh, in fall, try to get at least two herbicide applications in in the fall, or at least one for sure. Fall, a lot of those plants are bringing nutrients and things down to their roots, so you can kind of get a better um, translocation and full kill. Um, sometimes the spring herbicide applications can be more of a chemical top mow down. Um, and then I usually recommend to avoid disking if possible not possible all the time, depending on what your planting method you want to use is, what's there, et cetera. But if you're going to disc, realize that that soil disturbance is going to bring some weed seeds to the surface. So you want to make sure you have enough time to do at least another herbicide application after you do soil disturbance so you can take care of anything, uh, any weed seeds that are brought into that germination zone. Um, and then don't apply fertilizer. A lot of our uh, native plants are used to, I guess, what we would call poorer soil types or soils in general. And the application of fertilizer can actually really encourage annual weeds and other weedy species. So these won't need any fertilizer when you put them down. Uh, and then choosing native seed, definitely important, uh, native local to your area, wherever that area is. And it doesn't need to be necessarily in the county over, but kind of we have the country separated out into general eco regions. Um, but definitely choosing seed that's, that's native to that area. Uh, an ideal ratio of grass to forbs or wildflowers in a seeding mix is about 40% grasses to 60% forbs and at least no more than 50% grass. What we try to do is keep those tall, aggressive native grasses to a lower level. And some of those tall native grasses would be things like uh, big blue stem, switchgrass, and Indian grass. Uh, they are native, but they can be rather aggressive and they can take over a planting and um, they can knock out your forbs, which as we have talked about for a lot of our cane bird species, those forbs are really crucial to chicks. Um, the forbs bring in the bugs, they produce the seeds. So you really want to have a good diverse forb component in there. And uh, the graph on the right here kind of shows different bloom times and bloom colors for some Indiana wildflowers. So having a nice diverse mix out there with things that are blooming early, middle, and late in the season will help attract bugs throughout the whole summer. And different colors and different flower shapes will also attract different kinds and species of bugs, which are very important to a lot of wildlife. Um, our typical planting windows for native, uh, native habitat is the dormant window, which is December 1st to February 28th, and then April 1st to June 15th. You know, planting can be done by broadcast seeding or using a no-till native grass drill. Either method will require a carrier or filler for native seed. Uh, native seed is really small. A lot of times um, the grass seeds are really fluffy. In your fields, uh, if you're gonna broadcast seed, there's a lot of different options for people to broadcast seed, especially if you have a smaller area that you're interested in. Um, you can use a fertilizer push cart. You can have a little fertilizer spreader behind an ATV. Um, you could even get a five gallon bucket and throw it out by hand. So um, it doesn't have to be crazy equipment to do some of these plantings, but if you're gonna do a broadcast seeding, you're gonna look for 60 to 80% bare soil. Um, so that seed can get really good seed to soil contact. That's definitely important. Uh, so you're going to want to eliminate that thatch layer, or that dead plant material layer on top of the ground. So if you know you're going to broadcast seed, you, you might have to disc beforehand to incorporate that thatch layer. Um, so it, the couple of different variables that would be specific to your project. Um, but a great thing about uh, broadcast seeding in that dormant uh, winter time is that the freeze thaw of the soil will naturally work those seeds into an appropriate depth. Uh, it's great if you can broadcast those seeds just before or just after light snow to kind of insulate and protect them. But if you do a broadcast seeding in the spring, you're going to want to cultipack or roll the area before and after the seeding to really get it pushed in in good seed to soil contact. Um, and if you're going to use a drill, 
definitely use one that's designed or that's designed for planting native grasses and wildflowers. Um, and you're going to want to make sure everything's on the lowest settings. A lot of these native seeds are so small, you really shouldn't plant them more than a quarter of an inch deep, and sometimes even lower than that. <clears throat> so making sure you have a drill that's designed to not plant them too deep will be important. And if you need help finding one, uh, you can contact your local NRCS or Farm Bill Biologist or Soil and Water <clears throat> Conservation District. A lot of them have drills available to rent. And then what is it going to look like um, after, after you've planted it? Uh, so <laughs> they, they don't look beautiful the first year. That's definitely something else to think about. Think about your timeline. A lot of these grasslands are not fully established until about three years after they're planted. Uh, and you may need to do some maintenance in the first year, mowing it high. And by high, I mean 10 to 12 inches off the ground. Um, if you have a lot of weed pressure that is shading out your seedlings. So you can kind of see that here in this picture on the right. That's a lot of mare's tail. Um, but you can also see that there's sunlight still getting to the ground there. So if you got sunlight, then it's totally okay. Um, but this area was airflow seeded uh, into bean stubble, which is always easier to plant into bean stubble or an old crop field situation um, in 2017. And then this picture is another area of that same field, um, just not as much mare's tail, but this, this landowner decided to mow this field high um, in July of 2017. So you can see you've got some, some black-eyed Susans and some blooms in there that's happening. Um, and then the next year, uh, in early May of 2018, so this is starting its second growing season. And again, it didn't look like much um, that second year. But by July of 2018, um, we really had some nice grass establishment. We've got all sorts of different wildflowers in there. We've got some little blue stem coming up in the front frame. Uh, and this is just its second growing season. So by the second season, you'll see a lot more flowers. By three growing seasons later, we think they're, we like to think they're fully established. Um, and I know for a fact that this landowner has a, quail, a covey of quail on his property that are just loving this uh, grassland area. Um, and then monitoring your planting after that, once three, you know, definitely for the first three years, still monitor. And then after three years, continue that monitoring, go out there in different seasons, spring, summer, fall, look what's growing. Um, spotting an invasive species early can make a world of difference. Uh, treat them before they become a really large and costly problem. And you can also see the wildlife that are out there utilizing your grassland at different stages. And um, enjoy yourself too, a lot of pretty flowers out there, so. And then you may have a, probably one of the more common things we see uh, if you already have an open area, um, could be an old CRP planting. Um, so you can renovate and restore these areas that you already have that are open. Um, some issues we have with old grasslands, especially old CRP, are rank native grasses. So old, thick, maybe haven't been managed in a little while. Um, woody encroachment and then non-native cool season grass encroachment. And this, uh, a publication by Purdue is excellent. It's got a lot of tips for um, renovating and restoring warm season grasses for wildlife. It's got great herbicide recommendations in there for a lot of common invasive species problems. Um, so I definitely high, highly recommend reading through this if you're interested in grasslands. And uh, we will be sending out a link to this, I believe at the end. Um, but I, I definitely use this a lot and I re I'll reference it a lot <laughs> in this presentation. So rank native grasses, a lot of our older CRP plantings really had a high percent of those tall aggressive grasses, switchgrass, blue stem, Indian grass, um, and they kind of become almost food deserts. Uh, the bottom left picture there, it's almost all grass. It's a thick stand of grass. So it doesn't have those forbs, doesn't have those seeds that your wildlife are looking for. It's going to be hard for animals to move around and through it in that bottom layer. And then without those forbs, uh, these big grass areas also tend to fall over in the winter and then they're flat and then they're not providing habitat or anything useful for anyone really. Um, so this next video we're going to watch is actually really going to highlight how different management options can really change the composition of these old grasslands uh, and why keeping up a management rotation in general is really important. 
Hello there. This is Ryan Owen and Sam Dame with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever here in Indiana. We'd like to take some time today to discuss some different management options that you can use to help you out with your warm season grass and wildflower plantings. We'll be looking at a field that's been split up into three different sections. Two of those sections have been managed and the one behind us has yet to be managed at all. You can see that we've got a lot of cottonwoods starting to pop up in the back and the grass itself, which is a mix of switchgrass, big blue stem, and some Indian grass, is starting to get very tall, very rank, and is so dense that not much wildlife can move through it. If we come in and examine at the ground level, you'll notice that the thatch from years past has built up on here, making it very hard for chicks of game birds, whether they be northern bobwhites or ringneck pheasants, to move effectively and forage in this condition. So as just kind of a little test, we're gonna have Sam here walk into the stand and we'll see just how dense this grass is getting. Sam? As you can see, this grass is extremely dense, very thick, and almost so dense that Sam can hardly get through it. Next, we'll show you the management strategies that have been applied to the other two sections, and you can decide for yourself which one you'd like to use on your property. So the first management technique we're gonna look at is prescribed fire by itself. The plot behind us was burned in March of this year. We've got about four months of growing season behind us now, and you can see that we still have a very dense stand of tall vegetation. So on a density perspective, we didn't really gain a whole lot. What we did gain is removing the thatch at ground level. So as you can see here, we did open up some ground network there's a lot more space available for quail chicks or pheasant chicks to scurry in through here, find escape cover, and find food to forage upon. What I'm gonna have Sam do again is walk into the plot and we'll see just how far she can get in there as kind of a perspective on how dense this vegetation really is. Sam? And you can see we put the green shirt on her so she camouflages in and shows this a little bit better. But as she gets in there, you'll notice that at some point we start to really lose her. So the next technique we're going to examine is a combination of prescribed fire and disking. So the plot behind us, which is immediately adjacent to the plot you just saw, which was just burned by itself, was both burned in the fall and then followed up with a disking. The disking consisted of about three passes of a fairly heavy disc. And you can see immediately that we've got a great reduction in density in our taller grasses just from that disking. So not only do we have a reduction in the grass density, but we also get a great flush of annual forbs, whether they're common ragweed or black-eyed Susan, we didn't have that same complement come in with just prescribed burning alone. So having some of these forbs is gonna provide more diversity and a greater food benefit for the birds you might have in your stand. And again, we're gonna have Sam walk through the stand and see how dense the grass is. So you can see here again, the density is much less than what we had when we lost Sam and the uh, burned only stand thanks for watching for more information so uh, some of the other common problems you can have with some of your uh, grassland areas would be non-native cool season grass encroachment that often happens if you've converted a lawn area to a uh, native grass area or it's a pasture conversion We'll get things like tall fescue or bluegrass or orchard grass coming back in. Uh, some of the best options for kind of renovating these areas are going to be to use herbicides to knock back those cool season grasses. Uh, another popular problem is woody encroachment. So most of Indiana wants to be woods. 
Um, but regular rotational management can help slow down woody, recroach, woody encroachment. Uh, you might have noticed in that video that first section that hadn't been managed had cottonwoods and things coming up in it. The other two managed uh, sections had very few saplings. So keeping that on a regular rotational basis can help with that. Um, a well-timed prescribed burn may kill certain tree species, um, but herbicide applications may be required uh, depending on the size, the, the tree species. And Amy's gonna talk more about um, some of those particular techniques. Um, finally, just wanna talk a little bit about um, why we manage grasslands. Um, what we're doing is really trying to set back natural succession um, as these areas progress, um, they'll slowly transform into that late successional state. Uh, historically, I believe Indiana was about 90% forest, so most of Indiana wants to transition to that forest if left unattended. Um, but management and maintenance can provide a diversity of habitats, which leads to a diversity in wildlife. Having these uh, different habitat types next to each other can um, help benefit a lot of different wildlife species and have a lot of their needs close together for them. Uh, for quail in particular, um, some of the best habitat is three to five years post some sort of disturbance. Um, and some of the management options that, some of the, the three most common management options would probably be prescribed fire, disking, and herbicide application. And the one you use will depend on what your specific uh, area looks like. Um, but some of the pros of these different ones, um, prescribed fire can be really efficient. Uh, if you are willing to do it yourself, um, it can be quick and it can be cost effective. Um, like we saw in the video, it really removes thatch and opens up bare soil, can help recycle nutrients, set back some woody species, um, can encourage some growth about fi um, from fire adapted species. Uh, disking can help control small trees, set back some thick stands of grass like we saw in that video, um, promote some of those really wildlife friendly weeds like your common ragweed and foxtail, um, you can make your fire breaks with it. Uh, and then herbicide can be effective at controlling small trees and cool season grasses. Um, it can help set back those rank stands of grasses to reduce that grass density. It can be hired out easily. Um, it can be the best option if you have an invasive species problem. Uh, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Amy to talk some more about woodland management options. Thanks, Sam. That was a great presentation and um, very detailed information about grasslands. So I'm gonna, bring things a little closer to the forest. I thought we'd start out with forest edges. So as Sam kind of highlighted before, an edge is where you've got two different habitat types that are intersecting together. And we often refer to edges as either being hard edges or soft edges. So a hard edge would be a place where you had maybe, you know, like a field and it's going right up against bluntly to a, a section of forest with very tall trees, whereas a soft edge would um, have more of a gradual transition. So it might go from, an, from a bare field to an area with grasses, maybe some brambles, some shrubs, and kind of gradually transition into smaller trees until it got to that, that forest area. We know that edges are really important for a variety of wildlife and that wild turkey often will use these areas or be in a close proximity to these areas during nesting. And a lot of that is because they provide a lot of cover and they're also close to the areas like open areas that they might be using later when those young poults are gonna need to be looking for food sources. So good strategies can be thinning overstocked areas of forest just to encourage that dense plant growth and then leaving a lot of that residual stuff behind in the woods, leaving treetops behind in the woods um, to provide cover and limiting a lot of those um, disturbing activities during the nesting season. So try to limit mowing, et cetera, during April through May if possible. Just a little bit more on edge feathering or creating that softer edge. That can be done a couple of ways. One way, um, if you don't have a field that you can move into is you can bring that edge back into the woods. And so that's done by um, thinning out the tree canopy, maybe about 150 from where that maintained forest edge is. So maybe in that area adjacent to the, the edge would be thinned at a higher rate of about 75% of the tree canopy removed. And then gradually you might lessen that thinning to about 50%. And then gradually near the end, it might only just be a few trees removed until you got to that forest edge. If you've got open area to work with, you may consider planting that edge out. 
then you may want to select trees that are going to be beneficial and be mass producing or make food or different fruits for wildlife. So you might concentrate on smaller trees or larger shrubs near the forest line and then move that out to smaller shrubs and blackberry brambles and then maybe finish it off with an area with some of those warm season grasses and prairie flowers. Whenever you're thinking about a new tree, tree planting, um, it's always really important, just like with grasslands, to select native trees and shrubs that are adapted to the site because they're going to be the most successful. You always want to pick areas too that you're going to get plenty of sun because that's very important to making sure that the trees are going to be able to be healthy and be productive. And as always too, you might have to do some site preparation. Like for instance, if the area had some invasive brush you needed to remove beforehand, that's important to contend with before you do the tree planting. Likewise, if you are planting into an area that maybe was a hay field, you need to do some work beforehand to reduce and eliminate that fescue that might be there. And Sam gave plenty of great um, ideas for how to do that. When you're ready to do the, the tree planting, you may want to consider what method you're going to use. If you're planting a small number of trees, they often can be planted by hand with tools um, such as a dibble bar or a tree planting bar. But if you're doing a larger planting, it's much more efficient to use um, an implement like a tree planter that can be attached to a tractor and can plant those trees quickly. And that's not something that most people have on hand, but there are a lot of contractors out there that can help with those services. After the planting, um, you may want to consider protecting those trees from deer browse that can become an issue. And also you can't just plant trees and walk away because a lot of times there's a lot of other vegetation that can pop up that may inhibit their growth. And especially during those first few years, you wanna really make sure that those trees are, are free of a lot of weed competition just so that they can get established. And then periodically you may have to go back and um, kind of do selective treatment to other volunteers. Tree plantings are really great to use um, on those edge areas, but they're also great at connecting habitat patches. So if you own land and you're in an area where maybe forest cover is a little bleak, you might be able to really increase the habitat and connect different patches together by really targeting where you're putting those plantings. So here in this picture, we've got a patch of forest on one side, and then there's a smaller patch on the other. And you can see that dark line that goes through the farm field. That's, that's just a nat natural water drainage. So that would be an ideal location to plant trees. Not only is it, is it gonna improve water quality and reduce erosion, it's also gonna connect those habitat patches together. Those streamside areas too are really important for wildlife and for turkey. When um, hens and their broods are looking for places to um, for the brooding time period, they're rarely gonna be very far away from a water source. So leaving a buffer of managed trees and vegetation on at least 100 feet on either side of the stream or river can be really important. Um, you wanna always look for trees that are gonna be good food producing trees. And then if you can protect that area from livestock grazing. Livestock can do a lot of damage into the woods. Not only can they damage young trees and um, the future value of your trees, they also can destroy a lot of important nesting habitat. You can really see that in this picture um, on the slide, you know, there's a barbed wire fence going through. And then on the left side, you have an ungrazed area. And you can see all the green growth that's on the forest floor. And it's a stark difference from the right side that's being grazed at the moment. Sam really hit um, greatly on how open areas are utilized by quail. And it's not just quail that benefits from those areas. Those are really important areas for wild turkey during the brood rearing season. That um, structure and that cover she was discussing is perfect. Those are the ideal areas that wild turkey want to take their young when they're looking um, for places to forage. So I won't go into great detail about that. But also understand too, even if you don't have those open areas, you can also can create good brood rearing areas inside of forest areas with management. Um, these two pictures on the side, these are from a research study that was done in Tennessee. So the top picture is a control stand. And then the bottom picture is one of the stands after they had done some different silvicultural treatments. 
And what really strikes me about this is this top picture, it looks so similar to the majority of the forest lands that I visit in Indiana. You know, over time, these forest lands, um, maybe they have oak and hickory trees in the overstory, but they've really filled in with a lot of dense growth of beech and maple trees. And that creates a lot of shade on the forest floor. And when we have that, we just don't have as much growth. This bottom picture was one of the study sites where they had the best success. And they did a combination of, of a retention cut along with doing periodic prescribed burning in that area. And you can just see the difference. There's so much sunlight coming in. There's a lot of growth. Um, so it's just much better habitat for those, for wild turkey to use during that time period. If left kind of unchecked, just like grasslands, this area will start to fill in again. So coming back with um, frequent fire return periods, intervals of three to five years is really important for maintaining that habitat. So we talked a little bit about forest land improvement and how that can be beneficial and one of the tools you can use. Um, so I just wanted to go into a little bit more of what that is and how a lot of times we apply that out in the, the forested landscape. So forest land improvement is also known by a few other terms. One is timber stand improvement or CSI. Or I've also seen it referred to as wildland stand improvement. Um, it, it's really all these are one and the same. They're all talking about manipulating the woody vegetation to improve growing conditions. And that's often for certain trees or for forest health, but it even can be for wildlife habitat as well too. Common tools of the tray that are used when doing work inside your forest are gonna include a variety of stuff. It could be anything from chainsaws to hand saws to axes, brush cutters, um, different tools to apply herbicide, and also tools that you might use in a prescribed fire operation as well too. Whenever you're working with these items, it's always to make sure that you're keeping your, your tools in good working order and keeping your tools sharp. All of these have necessary PPE or personal protective equipment that's important to use. And whenever you're using herbicides, you know, make sure that you're taking time to read the label. The label's law and has lots of important information to make sure that you're using it appropriately and it's being effective. And if some of these things are you're not comfortable working with, um, consider working with a contractor. A lot of those people are licensed and experienced and they're gonna be able to do that work easily. The forest stand improvement methods. Um, a lot of these are kind of centered around um, deadening undesired trees. And how we can do that is a tree, while you, know, you look at the tree and you think it might be all be living, most of the living part of a tree is gonna be found right inside the inner bark or in the cambium of the tree. So if we can um, use some of our tools to cut through that area or, in, or introduce herbicide to the tree, we can deaden the tree and leave it standing where it's gonna be beneficial habitat and give more growing space to other trees. And that's done through a variety of methods. One of the popular ones is girdling or ringing a tree. Another one that's often used is called hack and squirt. This one's nice because it doesn't require very many tools. It's very easy to carry a hatchet and a spray bottle with you in the woods. Um, if you wanted to actually cut down the tree and to, to that in it, you could do a cut stump treatment and then just apply the herbicide out the outer ring of the cut stump surface. Sometimes we have trees in the woods that it's the right species of tree, but maybe something is going on with the quality where we'd like to kind of start that tree over again. And we can cut that tree down and many different types of tree will respond to that by sprouting. So you can also can cut a tree down or coppice it and let it re-sprout naturally. And finally, there are some other ways that you can just apply chemicals to the outer bark of the tree as well too, and the chemicals will be absorbed in through there and will bed in the tree. These are all our, some of these methods are even ones that we'll employ when we're doing invasive species control as well too. Um, and lastly, grapevines. Grapevines are native to this area, but they can be in large numbers that can be detrimental to forest health. They can break out larger branches or even take down large trees, or sometimes they can just get so tangled into young growth it's hard for it to progress. So often too, a part of forest stand improvement is cutting grapevines, and it's good to cut a section of those vines out and then to apply herbicide to that cut. That cut. So how do we use these practices in the woods? Well, one common practice or um, strategy for forest stand improvement is something called crop clear leaves. 
And that's where perhaps we have a tree that we want to favor because of its desired benefits. So maybe this is a mass tree, maybe this is just a really you know, healthy tree, or maybe it's an area where we want to reduce the stocking and bring some sunlight in. So we could do something called crop release. And that's really just selectively thinning around certain trees and um, opening up the, the growing space around them. That's going to allow them to get more sunlight to their crown, let their crown um, expand, um, and just let them be growing in healthier conditions. A lot of times those open grown or larger dominant trees are prime sites for, for roosting for turkeys. They often pre prefer certain tree species like oak or maybe in a bottomland area, cottonwood. So giving those trees more room to grow is also gonna help that habitat. And then mass producing trees. We've been talking about that a lot because trees produce food that a lot of wildlife will use. So different types of mass are important. Soft mass is important and that soft fleshy fruit that um, is available from a variety of different shrubs and trees. So this is gonna be dogwoods, crab apples, persimmons, blackberries, raspberries, um, et cetera. And also hard mass is important. And those are the hard shelled seeds that we have of trees. And these are really beneficial too, because they have a very long shelf life. They're not something that's just gonna be abundant during one season, they're gonna be um, there. And if they're sitting around the forest floor, they're still gonna be good and beneficial later in the season. So good examples of this would be oak acorns, hickory nuts, hazelnuts, and beech nuts. So you may hear many people talk about oak trees and oak regeneration. And this has been a big concern for a lot of foresters and for wildlife biologists, because what we're seeing in our forests is that our oak forests aren't regenerating as they once did in the past. And this is a big concern, not only for species that eat acorns, but there's a whole bunch of other species that eat the things that eat the leaves. So a lot of um, caterpillar species are going to prefer oak, oak trees over other trees. So if we lose those from our forest areas, it's gonna be bad news for turkeys and a lot of other stuff too. Um, oak trees are also really important for our economy. Um, if they're not going to be regenerating like they have in the past, we know that with current demand that a lot of research is now suggesting that we could just run out of white oak in the next 30 years, which is a very devastating thing. So why aren't oak trees regenerating? Um, a big reason of it is that disturbances like fire don't occur on the landscape as they did historically. So we know that fire is an important tool. We've talked about that for grasslands and a little bit for forest lands. And historically, the indigenous people that live in this area use that also as a tool. And that used to help to maintain a lot of these oak, oak forest systems. Um, and it's, it's changed a lot over the years. Also, we have an overabundance of white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer eat a variety of food, a lot of green vegetation, but in the wintertime, they focus heavily on woody browse. So they eat a lot of woody stems and they have a high preference for browsing on oak trees and not so much other trees. So over time, that can really can influence what we're seeing regenerating in the woods. Invasive species are an issue, and also how we're managing the forest. Sometimes we're not doing anything in the woods, and when we're not putting that disturbance, it's not helping them along. Or sometimes when we're doing stuff, maybe we're doing the wrong thing. Like um, for instance, a timber harvest can be a really valuable thing to improve the, the health of your forest, but if you're only cutting out all of your high valued oak trees and you're not making any provisions for new ones to come into the forest stand, that's gonna have a negative effect on your forest. So what can we do? Um, well, one thing we can do is we know that we can, we can return fire back into these ecosystems because they're very adapted for it. Um, so oak woodlands can be maintained by cool surface fires. This is because they are a fire dependent species. So the black oak in the second picture, it has a very thick bark. So that fire going through that area is not going to be um, affecting or deadening it. It's a big stark difference from the next picture of the American beech that has a very thin bark that can't handle that heat. You know, you can see in that picture, the fire actually just popped off the bark. And when those, when those fires go through areas, they might top kill a lot of younger oaks but they're very adapted for that as well too, because they have dormant underground buds. So after a fire comes through, they'll readily resprout. 
we can also do what fire does mechanically. Um, and one of that way is by re just going in and just physically removing that dense mid-story area. This is a picture, this is actually it's from Morgan Monroe State Forest. So this is an area of forest that is untreated. And then probably about 300 feet away, this is a forest that have had a significant amount of oak restoration work. So they went in and they mechanically cut and deadened a lot of that thick, growth that had grown in into that oak woodland. And you can see the difference. It's, it's amazing how far you can see and the amount of light that's reaching the forest floor. Let's look a little bit closer at what that forest floor looks like. So here we've got a sassafras that's been cut and is laying on the ground. And you can see there's a bunch of growth of sedge and greenery. But if you look closely, there's little oak trees all over in that area. And hopefully now with this increase in sunlight, they'll be able to be taken up into the canopy one day. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about temporary forest openings. Um, a lot of our forests here in Indiana are, a lot of them are around the same age and over half of our forests are over 60 years of age. But we know that we only have less than 5% of forests that are under 20 years of age, which isn't a lot. And we can see from that graph before, the habitat um, type graph, that a lot of those younger areas are important for different species and will be utilized by wildlife such as wild turkey. So completing temporary forest openings is very beneficial to create that early successional habitat and also just to really to create a diversity of age classes across the forest as a whole. Kind of giving you an idea of what those thickets can look like. This is a lot of cover and it's a lot of a lot of berries and probably a lot of insects. This might be this, this looks like it'll be perfect quail habitat for them to utilize during the winter months. So we've talked about a lot of different ways to do this stuff, and some of these practices can complement or can go in addition with having a timber harvest. So if you are thinking about having a timber harvest on your property, there's a lot of really important questions you need to ask yourself. What are your goals? Is this the right time? What trees am I gonna cut? What trees am I gonna keep? How will I know which ones? You know, do I need a contract? What will this look like afterwards? And that's a lot of guesswork. So I just wanna iterate that you don't have to guess. You can hire a professional forester to help you with this and a lot of the other stuff. If you are looking for a professional forester, there's a great listing um, at findindianaforester.org. This is a professional listing that's maintained by the Indiana um, Forest and Woodlands Owners Association. But it kind of gives you a chance to peruse people, their experience, and maybe call a few people. If you're outside of Indiana, I'd really would recommend to look at Call Before You Cut. This is a great website that will give you different links to people to talk to um, in a variety of states. And also after today, because that's a whole other subject is timber harvesting, we're going to send out some good video links that have more, in more information after the presentation. So just to kind of round it all out, you know, we've been going back to this habitat chart and a lot of the species on here are game animals, but if you, you could put up, a, you know, so many different types of habitat charts on there and you're going to see that wildlife utilize different habitat throughout their life cycle. Some might be really important and during some times and some might be, be important during others, but uh, we just need to make sure we're doing our best to make sure that that habitat is available for, for them. And that's just not a one-step approach. It might involve different things on the landscape. All right, so we talked about a lot of different things and you may be asking yourself, where can I find help for, you know, this is a lot of stuff. And there are a lot of sources out there for financial and technical assistance. And all of the things that we talked about today, there are programs out there that can help you with that financially. So a good first place to um, go to would be the National Resource Conservation Service, the NRCS, and reach out to the district conservationist because they can give you more information about maybe specific programs that might be beneficial and give you a good direction of where to go next. And Sam, I think you probably have done a lot more work with CRP. Do you wanna to touch on that? Yeah, sure. So CRP um, is another farm bill um, program that can offer some financial assistance. Um, really, that's geared toward areas that have a cropping history. Um, but like, like Amy said, a lot of the practices and things we talked about could be available through CRP um, or EQIP. Um, 
but CRP can be a great option if you have a crop area that you're interested in converting, converting over or um, edge areas. Uh, we didn't talk too much about that, but habitat doesn't have to be a whole field conversion. Uh, Amy talked about it a little bit with um, tree plantings to connect habitat areas. Uh, if you have crop areas, you could always do some buffers that can connect to different habitat patches to each other. Um, so really, if you can't provide necessarily everything in one space, providing a connector to areas with bigger habitat um, acres can also be really beneficial to wildlife. Um, and that's something you could talk to the um, Farm Service Agency or FSA if you're interested in a program like CRP. Great, yeah. And then um, also soil and water conservation districts often have great um, equipment or maybe they have local grants that are out there. Um, the state DNR has several different programs and resources that you can contact as well too. And then also Pheasants Forever and NWTF. But if you're looking for somebody that's gonna help you doing stuff on the ground, I would just really iterate to that, that directory of professional foresters from the, the IFWA guide. They have a great listing and call a couple people, find somebody that's gonna be as excited about the projects that you're doing as you are. Um, there is also a great list of contractors too that's in the State of Indiana Cooperative Invasives Management website or SICM. A lot of these people are also foresters, but there's also different contractors that just really specialize in invasive species control as well too. And then finally, um, NRCS has a great list of technical service providers or foresters for hire that really have received special training on NRCS programs and planning. And you can find um, those through our website or if really, if you just reach out to NRCS, we can help you with that too. And another great thing about NRCS and FSA and the Soil and Water Conservation Districts is a lot of times we are all housed in one building. So it can be a one-stop shop if you wanna come in and visit. <laughs> Definitely true. Um, we'll send out more information, but just a couple of guides that we referenced a lot um, during this presentation was the Forest Improvement Handbook and also that Renovating Native Warm Season Grasses. These are great guides and they're available for free to download from Purdue Extension. And that is it. We thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Um, you know, we could have talked in depth about a lot of the different topics that we hit on. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, our emails and phone numbers are there on the slide. Thank you so much, Amy and Samantha. That was a ton of information. And like you said, we will share all of those uh, resources and things both in the YouTube video description and also on the Women for the Land website. So thank you very much.